Today I'm going to tell you the story of uh, an iconic school called as Nilbagh and its founder, the visionary David Hosbro. It was a free school. No tuition fees. The children's parents had never been to school, so they were first in generation learners. But David had, as a pedagogue, as an educationist, he had deep insights into education. He was inspired by two very prominent pedagogues. One was A.S. Neil of Summerhill, the first libertarian school in the whole world, started in 1920. This is 2021. Summerhill has lasted a hundred years. Just about a thousand children have passed out of Summerhill in these hundred years. But the massive impact it has had on education is indescribable. So he was inspired by Summerhill. Neil said that schools are, are prisons. He likened them to jails for children. And he said the children should, be, should have the freedom to go to school or not go to school. David agreed with that. Uh, there was no competition. There was emphasis on cooperation and not competition in this school. Children, all children learned five different languages. They spoke Telugu in their village, but it was adjoining to the Karnataka border, so they learned Kannada, Hindi, English, and Sanskrit. David thought that Sanskrit was very, very important. Now, what was the school like? What happened the whole day? When the first is that the keys of the school were with the children. This is the kind of autonomy. This is the kind of freedom which this school provided. The children could come and open the school. So in a true sense, they were the owners of the school. Over here, children could learn at their own pace. A child who was very bright uh, could, do, could cover three books in one particular year. A child who was weaker could take two years to finish the same book. So no child failed. Everyone succeeded at their own pace. And no child felt cramped uh, because they could learn at their own pace. A child could be doing fifth class Telugu, third class Kannada, seventh class English, and second class maths at the same time. So there was this flexibility. And uh, because there was a mixed age group, if you look at a, in a house, the children learn from the, their older siblings and they teach to the younger ones. They learn from their uncles, aunts, parents. That was the kind of family atmosphere there. If a child did not understand a particular thing, he or she would go to the nearest child, would just finish that. And that child would be a better teacher, much less authoritarian than an adult. So this was the kind of pedagogy. There was a lot of emphasis on learning by doing. David Horsbro himself uh, was a very accomplished carpenter. He was a mason. He was a handyman. Um, he was a theater person. And of course, a writer, a very prolific writer. Uh, he also thought that uh, poetry was very important because it, it, imbues a heart, the, it would imbue the children's heart with great sensitivity. And they would have these Socratic kind of dialogues. Because children who came from a very poor village had lots of questions. And they would be, children would be asking questions and they would try, they would try and answer them. So there was a kind of a dialogue. And children were drawn to this school like a magnet. It was a very welcoming school. Uh, they would come an hour before the school started because this village had nothing to offer to them. The school was so much more fun. There was a lot of emphasis on art, on pottery, on carpentry, on embroidery, on theater, uh, the, the artwork. Very, very important. I've actually seen a girl of class fourth who actually made a small cupboard with her own hands and took it back home. Children used to cut a lot of jigsaw puzzles using a fret saw. They would paint it. And sometimes uh, uh, they would sell them to bigger schools and make a bit of pocket money on that. 
but you thought that he, it was very important. David Hosbro also talked about the discipline which the material exerts on a child. There is an internal discipline. He says that, suppose uh, if I make a mistake in English, then my teacher can correct me that you've used the wrong tense. But suppose you take a lump of clay and put it on a potter's wheel. If you don't place it in the center, the wheel is going to cry back at you and say, what, what on earth? Place me at the center. It's going to wobble. It's going to cry aloud. This is the discipline of the material exerting on the child. You don't have to grade the child, but the material itself cries out to you that you've done something wrong, correct. He gives the example that if you plane wood, you can only plane it along the grain. But if you plane it across the grain, it would become rougher, not smoother. Another example is that here is a newspaper with me. The newspaper is always aligned along the grain. Now, if I take this newspaper, I can cut strips like this, which will be parallel. But if I take the same newspaper and cut them across, I get very small pieces of paper. I can't cut them into long strips like this. Now, this is the internal discipline of the material. Um, he, he, he takes the name of Eric Gills, who was a sculptor, who talked a great deal about this. So working with diverse kind of materials teaches us a great deal. Children learn a great deal without being taught. He also, he also felt that the teacher training colleges were absolutely absurd because no teacher training college has a school attached to it. It's like trying to learn swimming by just reading a manual without plunging into water, without flagellating your hands and legs. You can never learn swimming. So he found it to be very essential that Neil Bagh should have a teacher training college. And he said, if, if I take trained teachers, they've already been, uh, they already, uh, they're not good at all because the training is bad. So in the 70s, mid 70s, he advertised, wanted teachers, but not trained. Because a lot of harm has been done to teachers who go through a training college. So he wanted raw teachers. And he would have a dormitory for them. Two years the teachers would spend in Nilbagh. Uh, in the evening they would learn about theory. And the next day he said, this is your lab. The school is your laboratory. Where you test it out. Whether this theory holds forth huh? or you can bunk this theory. Uh, that's the kind of very solid training and there are lots of people, uh, uh, Rohit Dhankar, uh, Malti, Amukta Mahapatra, um, uh, Usha, and Narsiman. These are the few I know who underwent training. Uh, my friend, late Sushmita Banerjee, was also trained with David Hosbro. And they all became great teachers in their own rights in due course. He also said that the task of the teacher was not to teach but to create conditions where children can learn. So creating conditions for learning, which are non-authoritarian, there was no punishment. He also said that the, because of the exam pressure, when the children are at the creative best, uh, 12 years, 13 years, because of the exam pressure, these creative paths get totally clouded out. So there were no exams or tests in Neil Bar. There were no punishments. There was emphasis on cooperation rather than competition. And there were no servants or sanitary staff. Because the children studied there, they readied and cleaned up the whole place. Every Saturday, uh, there was a register. On one side were the children's name, and the other side were the duties. And each child was assigned to do a particular task. There was no electricity in Nilbagh. And children had to pull out water from the well and put them in the matka, in the pitchers for the classroom next week. Some would arrange the books, some would broom, some would mop. So would, they would clean up the whole place. And this is very different from the Gandhian emphasis of producing for the market. Children were studying in that school and they were cleaning up for their own sake. Uh, because 
during the whole day they would be given a meal of ragi puttu or something very substantial and the children helped in the kitchen uh, to cook these meals uh, Neil Bagh also ran a small dispensary because the village had no PHC, no hospital was close by. Uh, Doreen would help in the dispensary and children would take turns to go to the dispensary to help in the bandaging, to help cleaning the wounds of, of wrapping medicines. So this way the children were being used. Uh, also, David realized that theatre was very important. You know, they were 12 years, 13 years old with no tradition of learning. Their parents had never been to school, but they were reading the seventh play by Shakespeare and they were enjoying it very much. He thought that Shakespeare was very, very important because the issues which Shakespeare talked about, you look at Merchant in Venice, well, there is a saukar in the village. Children could relate to it immediately. If you read Romeo and Juliet, there are so many love cases uh, in the village. So because children were able to relate to Shakespeare and they enacted it out. And sometimes they would, uh, they would sit on, uh, they would have theater, children would design all the costumes, all the lightning. Some kids would sit on the, on the trees to focus lighting. Uh, David had a old Austin car and often the searchlight or the headlight of the car was used to, uh, uh, to brighten up the stage. And of course, the children often dismantled the car and put it back again and honed their, honed their skills as mysteries, as mechanics. So there was a lot of emphasis on doing with the hands. Many times, David Horsbrough was asked that why are you imbibing these sensitivities in very poor village children? Um, you know, there is this caste, class, gender, which exists, which is a reality in the villages. And he had an answer to these. He said, I'm trying to give these children, village or whatever, the best possible education which I can. And of course, uh, they would feel alienated from the conditions of their village. There were many girls who were 15, 16, who refused to marry at an early age. They rebelled against. Um, they wanted to do higher education. So he said that in a, in, a, in a way, he was trying to create misfits. And it was not his purpose to indoctrinate them. Some of them would go out to the cities for a better livelihood. Some would come back and, and work in the, in the village itself. But he said, I'm not going to tell them to stay in the village itself. It will be their choice. Between father and son, David and Nicholas, they wrote about a hundred books which were published by the, by the Oxford University Press and Orient Longman. And they were very, very popular books in the 70s and the 80s. And he got a substantial amount of royalty from them. And this royalty gave him the financial independence to be able to continue this experiment. Uh, in 1984, after David's death, uh, it became very difficult for his wife, Doreen, and son, Nicholas, to run the school. Because a creative oasis like this, in, the, in a vast, barren terrain of education, uh, puts a big question mark that the state is spending so much money on its schools, and it's constantly producing failures. And so it became very, very difficult. David was able to manage the school somehow. But after that, then Doreen and Nicholas decided to shut the school. And they handed it over to the Krishnamurti Foundation. They sold it for a small price. Uh, Krishnamurti Foundation, the KFI, Rishi Valley, tried to put a caretaker there, but eventually found no one who would replace David Hospro. It was during that period when the KFI was trying to decide the future of Neil Bach that there were three meetings and I had the privilege of visiting Neil Bach. In one of them, the school was still on so I could see some of the activities. Uh, afterwards, I think the Krishnamurti Foundation sold Neil Bach 
to an organization which uh, works for uh, special children. Uh, and this was the, but the family was not interested in the money out of the royalties. So they set up a trust, the Neil Buck Trust, which uh, all these years, the royalties which accrued to David Hosbro uh, from the sale proceeds of the books uh, helped run a couple of small schools like Suma One, like Malti's school, etc. I think uh, the school is very historic. Uh, prior to independence, we had Shanti Niketan set up by Rabbi Nath Tagore. We had uh, the Dakshin Murti Bal Mandir set up by where Gijubai Badeka, uh, the author of the iconic book, uh, Diva Swapn, the greatest treatise on education in the last century which came out from India, they ran these schools. But I think post-independence, it is only Neil Bag and Neil Bag alone which showed the possibilities of nurturing the creative potentials of village children, first generation learners whose parents never been to school and shown possibilities that these children can, create, can gain great heights if we just invested into them. So this is the historic significance of Neil Bach and that's why this experiment needs to be documented.